Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening or this afternoon, depending on where our national audience may be. I'm Loretta Yarlow, Director of the University Museum of Contemporary Art, the UMCA at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. It's a great pleasure to present this live chat with artist Alison Saar in conjunction with the exhibition Mirror Mirror, The Prince of Alison Saar from the collection of Jordan D. Schnitzer and his family foundation. The exhibition is on view at the UMCA until April 30th. However, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the exhibition is only on view for our academic community. But we invite everyone to check out the virtual exhibition on our website that's been designed specifically for all of those who want to learn more about the exhibition and for a deep dive into the work of Alison Saar. Our museum is honored to host this first comprehensive survey of Alison Saar's prints produced over the last 35 years and to include several of her important sculptures. Allison's developed an incredibly rich and varied artistic practice in all her imagery. She directly addresses issues of race and boldly asserts the strength of black female identity. Her prints and sculptures narrate stories of the African-American experience, moving from the personal to the political. Often she charts the tragic history of slavery in America, but her figures symbolize defiance and strength. Tonight, we're thrilled to have Allison Saar with us in conversation with Karen Krasinski, professor in the UMass Art History Department, who teaches courses on modern and contemporary art, post-war European art, identity politics, and methodology. And Juana Valdez, professor in the art department and director of their printmaking studio. Juana's own work as an artist analyzes and decodes experiences of migration as a person of Afro-Caribbean heritage. Juana and Karen will each select specific works in the exhibition to discuss with Allison, and they will offer their insights and commentaries. Joining us tonight, I have the great pleasure and great honor to welcome Jordan Schnitzer, perhaps the most important collector of contemporary prints in this country. We're so grateful to Jordan for providing works to this exhibition from his immense print collection, for sponsoring the exhibition's education program and producing a catalog resume on Allison Saar's work in conjunction with the exhibition. I'm thrilled Jordan is here tonight with us to offer his introductory remarks on what led him as a collector to pursue Alison Saar's work and continues to this day. But first, I'm honored to turn to our chancellor, Kumble Subaswamy, who is here to offer his recorded message, articulating his gratitude to Jordan for helping us bring this milestone exhibition to our community. Hello and welcome to the University Museum of Contemporary Art. It's our great privilege to host Mirror Mirror, The Prince of Alison Saar, an exhibition made possible by a grant from Jordan D. Schnitzer and his family foundation. As one of the most prominent black female artists in the country, Alison Saar explores the African-American experience using figures of defiance and strength to narrate our tragic history of slavery. This exhibition comes to us at an extraordinary time as our nation experiences a collective urgency to address our legacy of systemic racism. Given the power of art to challenge and change perspectives, we are honored for this opportunity to broaden Alison Saar's influence. And of course, we're immensely grateful to Jordan Schnitzer for once again, generously loaning from his collection. Just as he gave us an opportunity to experience the artists Kara Walker and Leonardo Drew, by now sharing the work of Alison Saar, our students and the broader community have access to a truly transformative cultural experience. We also appreciate Jordan's financial support, which allowed the museum to create a virtual exhibit of Alison Saar's art and ensure even greater access to her work. On behalf of the entire university, I thank Jordan for his commitment to UMass. By expanding our access to the profoundly important artists of our time, he uniquely advances our mission to teach, discover, and engage. Thank you, Jordan. Indeed, thank you, Jordan. We're overjoyed to bring you back to UMass, even virtually. 
we feel you're here with us uh, in uh, in the virtual world. So uh, Jordan, I'd like to turn the mic over to you at this time to tell us a bit about your connection to the work of Alison Saar. Well, um, I've said at the university for those other exhibitions and I can't wait to get out there to see this one because you do such a fabulous job that in my opinion, artists are always chroniclers of our time. They're the ones forcing us to deal with issues uh, of society. The first time I saw Allison's work, it just, you didn't need to think, you just felt. You felt the power, the anguish, the, 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 the where defiance is being used and uh, just uh, uh, was swept away in a journey that hasn't stopped since the first acquisition. In fact, uh, uh, I've been able now to buy a number of her works in position to have mounted this exhibition, which has gone around the country. It started at the University of North Texas at Denton, where uh, Allison received the Southern Graphics Print Council Lifetime Achievement Award, and they had a new gallery opening up in the new 200,000 foot art center. And uh, it was a wonderful inaugural show for that space. And uh, it's traveled to half a dozen museums since. Why? Why Allison Saar? Um, there are many artists that I think do work that they think they should do. My sense, and I've never said this to Allison before, is this is a very visceral, um, it just flows out of her. And you see these amazing artistic creations that grab us and shake us up. And uh, I'm amazed each time at her creativity. Uh, and out of a woman that comes across with a very even temperament and so forth, uh, uh, works that are so powerful that shake us to our core. And for each of us, uh, I've suggested before that we all come to any art work loaded with a million little mosaic parts of all of our experiences. And therefore, each of us have a unique reaction to every art piece. But for me, when I see these images, of, uh, especially these very powerful women, and she's able somehow with the works on paper and the sculptural pieces to create this amazing tension between the, the, the subservience and the slave and the master to this sense in their eyes and their emotions of this defiance that, um, that just um, helps us understand the inequity and injustice and plight of, of, uh, of hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people that uh, uh, against their will uh, face circumstances that were beyond what any of us could imagine. So in her way, she is helping us go back in time to learn from the past to address the issues of the future because that's all we can do. We can't go back, we don't have a wand, uh, we don't have a mirror, as she uses, but we can look at ourselves today, our communities, our states, our country, and learn from her work. Let us, let us, that, uh, that she is to help us push forward out of the depths of the agony uh, that, uh, people that she depicts went through to uh, a beacon in the future where we all learn to accept each other, embrace our differences, and build this country individual by individual of our values within us uh, that collectively uh, make the world a better place. So I... Uh, uh, an honor to have her work in our collection. I'm thrilled again. Uh, Laura the Yarrow is just a, a, a whirling dervish of convincing me to do whatever she wants. And for any of you that know her, you can't say no. Uh, but the student body there, I was so impressed with the student docents, with the way the uh, uh, professors and faculty and students embraced the last two shows. And I hope that every single student on that campus and everyone in the Amherst and the surrounding counties visit the wonderful space there and are touched in various ways by this amazing artist who's gracing the walls at the 
UMass Amherst Art Museum. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Um, we're all moved by Allison's work and I'm moved by your words as always. Thank you so much. And now before turning the mic over to Allison, Juana and Karen, I wanna remind everyone that we'll conclude the event with a Q&A session. Uh, our education curator, Amanda Herman, will be fielding your written questions uh, for Allison, Jordan, Juana and Karen throughout the, um, the event through your, um, you have an option to submit your questions to her on your screen. Uh, so deep appreciation to Amanda, to Erica McIntyre, the production manager at the Fine Arts Center, Emma Messier and Christine Tessiera for their skillful behind the scenes work that helped bring this uh, production forward. Um, and by the way, it's being recorded. So if anyone has missed it, or if you want to uh, listen again to all that's said tonight, uh, we will find you find the recording archived on our website. So Allison, what an enormous pleasure to welcome you here. I only wish we had you in person at a real exhibition opening. Um, but in keeping with our practice to hear firsthand what an artist has to say about his or her work, I now want to turn the conversation over to you, to Juana, and to Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Hey, Karen. Hi, Juana. Hi, <laughs> Great. Uh, do you mind if I take a moment to just thank the uh, Chancellor Subhaswani for his kind words and also Thank you, Jordan. And again, thank you so much for uh, you know sharing your collection with everyone. It's really important to me that this these exhibitions are going to university museums and uh, being seen by students. Um, and so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I want to second that. Thanks. And thank you, Allison, for your generosity and being here to answer some questions and have a conversation with us. I think Juana's going to start with her uh, first question. I will. Um, and again, and we want to welcome you to, to UMass um, and, and encourage everyone uh, on campus, if they can, to go see the exhibition. I have, we had the opportunity to see it and it's absolutely beautiful and, and it's exceptionally to be able to have the sculpture as well. And that makes it twice as exciting to see. Um, so, Alison, I'm going to start with the first question, and I'm actually going to premise that with a quote that I read today, in which uh, it's by Christina Sharp in a hyperallergic uh, for the, the essay title, Alison's Art, the Alchemist. And it starts with, uh, Alison's art is a theorist of material. Materials is her praxi, and by which I mean art is interested in idea and material. And so my first question, which is, I like to combine multiple questions at once, and I'm going to let you speak because that's really the, the interesting part of this. Can you speak to the relation of printmaking to sculpture in your work? Uh, do you transition from prints to sculpture, or is it the reverse? And how significant is materiality in your work? Yeah. How does the use of found material in your sculpture transfer into texture in your prints? Okay. Well, um... Yeah, I consider myself primarily a sculptor, but you know, I've always been interested in printmaking. I basically was a toddler when my mother was at Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach and getting her print degree, working on printmaking. And so it was really kind of like my first world outside of the home was crawling underneath presses at Long Beach. Um, and so I've always really loved it, but um, I think I'm a real, um, you mentioned materials. I'm very much about materials. I'm very much about texture. I'm very tactile. I'm like actually holding my hands down by my side. So I'm not, you know, everything is expressed <laughs> through my hands. And so for me, you know, I think the issue I've had with prints historically is that, you know, I've always been kind of discouraged by how flat they are. And so, um, you know, I've become really intrigued with uh, working with great printmaking studios such as, um, Evan Press and Angelus Press and uh, Paul Maloney uh, or Maloney uh, print making in uh, San Francisco in that um, they're really open to kind of letting me explore and each even in with Lionel Haven working with an unorthodox materials and unorthodox grounds and you know silly cutout things so I've been really um, you know I think 
that's been part of you know my slowness in coming to printmaking. But I would say usually the sculptures are where they begin. Um, and I sometimes kind of view the prints as studies of sculptures. On occasion, there'll be prints that don't exist as sculptures, but for the most part, I'm making studies of the sculptures. And so they follow some time and sometimes they'll come about even a decade after the sculptures are made. But, um, you know, the materials are always really important in, in the making of the sculptures. And so trying to echo that and even, um, you know, sometimes bringing in some of those materials to, um, you know, utilize in the actual printmaking process has really been fun for me as well. Okay, thank you. Um, if you can go ahead to the next image. Uh -huh. I don't know, I wanna, okay. If we can, yeah, one more please. <laughs> and there we go, and uh, I'm gonna start the next question and then if we can continue with the images, that'll be fantastic. Um, so the next question is, when or how did the decision to work representational come about and the use of the female body in your prints and your, in your sculptures? And can you address the use of the female the female body in domestic labor settings? Are they specifically about the history of African American women um, in terms of uh, domestic laborers in the United States? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, I first, I would say that in my undergraduate work, I was working in abstract means. You know, the work was always about the spirit. You know, I think I was looking at Rothko and Albers and maybe, uh, tantric paintings and really interested in kind of talking about the spirit. And I think I got frustrated. And at the end of my um, my MFA at Otis, I, you know, my father had given me some tools. I made this little sculpture called CJT Blanc. And um, it was very crude. It looks a lot like the block of wood it started out with. But for me, it was something that I felt was really accessible. And so that was where, you know, I really thought that the figure was the best way to speak of um, these sort of things about spirit and pain and anguish and love and desire and all of those things. And then I think, um, you know, I'd done, you know, up until I think I had my first child, the work was kind of equally male and females were represented. And then I think when I had my son Kyle in 89, um, no, I was just really blown away by what the female body could do, <laughs> could bring these little things into the world. And it was just really astounding to me. And so then I really focused focused on that. And I think also because I come from a really, you know, a family of very strong women. My mother's really powerful, you know, in our household, it was my mother and my two sisters. And then, you know, my grandmother was a serious matriarch and kind of managed to wrangle all of the children and grandchildren. She had five children uh, her, of her own. And so you know, I've always had these really amazing examples of, um, of women and, you know, black women specifically um, in my personal experience. And then, I don't know, I think uh, looking at historically the places that you know, black women were allowed to, um, you know, function in, you know, you know, from slavery time until the present. And much of that time was spent in the kitchen and doing things uh, or menial labor as uh, char women or, um, you know, women that are cleaning or maintaining or taking, or as nannies, taking care of other people's children. You know, I think those are really powerful images to me. And I was really, um, you know, intrigued by their stories and how often they were never recognized. And sometimes these women would earn, you know, money, enough money to buy themselves and their family out of uh, out of slavery. You know, there are the, some really incredible stories of women that by doing very menial work and, you know, hard labor and, and these tasks that, you know, almost like this invisible population, they're able to do really amazing, astounding things. And so I think, you know, they're kind of like, my he my heroes of the past, you know, that they've kind of been able to maintain, you know, not only provide for their families, but also kind of, you know, bring order to the world, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, next slide, please. And I'm going to, this is going to be my last question so we can share your time. Um, and so I have to say from, from seeing the exhibition, there was something that struck me and um, 
when I went to see the exhibit, I realized it was really the intentionality behind it really stood out for me. So can you address the use of savored heads in your work? I noticed in, uh, that the eyes in your prints are often cut out, if not left in black. Uh, and so I'm curious to know what is the meaning well, with that within the work. And um, do you feel, this is sort of the last of the question, and this is in terms of your whole body of work now in retrospect, do you feel your work connects or speaks to a global African diasporic? Um, yeah, let me think if I can remember all those questions. <laughs> Well, uh, for instance, uh, the, the notion of the severed head in the work, which I think is really significant. Um, but I'm also intrigued, and if you can see this print, that the fact that the eyes are actually, at first I thought it was the white of the paper, and when I was in the exhibit, I saw that I actually physically cut out, and so that incision really sort of stood out for me, and, and, and it worked in a way that felt, I, I felt a, a sort of visceral sensation of pain and an invisibility and not being seen. And so I'm curious uh, to know how you imagine that in the work. Okay, well, um, yeah, you know, the severed heads, I think those initially came about just by materials. A lot of times the materials would dictate what I had, what I do. And I think those first heads came about, um, you know, I was living in New York at the time and uh, I would go through Prospect Park and find trees that have been cut down and they would cut them about two, feet wide and so it was kind of like like oh this is a head and so I was thinking more along the lines of you know traditional busts and things like that I think growing up my father had given me a book of Roman busts and um you know how these were kind of like these portrait heads and so I was kind of intrigued with that and but for this one you know there's more violence involved in it and you know as opposed to um, someone else having severed her head this is you know it's called conked which is um, a straightening of the hair process mm. and how she's basically sort of by straightening her hair, you know, and I'm, I'm into puns, you know, they're the, often lie was one of the ingredients in processing. Right. So she's kind of eating her the lie. And, um, you know, by kind of like aspiring towards, you know, blonde, long, straight hair, and, um, you know, these sort of um, Anglo sort of ideals of beauty or Western ideas of beauty, she's kind of severed her off from her true identity. And so this hair then kind of comes out of this severed, severed head and she's sort of leading this straight hair. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think it's, it's, I was thinking of these things metaphorically, although it comes out rather gruesome and kind of frightening in this example. Um, and then with the cutting out of eyes, you know, I think part of that, you know, I think the early work actually had eyes in them and they it's kind of, you know, that kind of fell away, but I got really interested in this sort of notion of, oh, I guess, you know, I saw some of those early pieces as well as sort of, um, sort of like sideshow po posters or banners and how, um, you know, I was thinking of Saji Bartman in particular and how, um, you know, she was always being put on display and, you know, how do you maintain dignity by not returning that gaze, by sort of shutting out that, you know, the white gaze or the, you know, the, the gaze of the oppressor or whoever. And so um, I kind of, the, you know, I, I started cutting the eyes out that they're kind of blank, that they're kind of allowing themselves to be in another place and another time and not being subjected to whatever abuse they were facing at that moment. And then they also kind of look like a trance and then it also becomes a mask. And especially with that one that we just saw where the eyes are physically cut out of the paper in that it's, you know, for me, a sort of removal. There's also, you know, a lot of talk about sort of, you know, access and, you know, spirit having access to the eyes. And a lot of times okay. seers circle their eyes with white um, to kind of like, you know, invite or, or um, repel good or bad spirits sort of thing. So I think that's kind of where, so it's, you know, it comes from a lot of different areas, but somehow it's, you know, every once in a while I'll put eyes in and I just feel like so uncomfortable that all of a sudden these pieces are staring back at me, like, like scribble their eyes back at me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's really intriguing in the work. And so the last part of the question is, do you, do you feel that your work speaks to a global African diasporic? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I've always been exposed to that, you know, my household, 
Um, you know, I said that my father had given me images of um, Greek and Roman and Renaissance sculptures that were very influential in my form. But meanwhile, my mother was looking at books of the art of Mexico and Africa and the Caribbean and the African diaspora. And so I think very much so those were really very influential components to my work. And um, I think I'm just really intrigued in how um, these, um, you know, stories and traditions and rituals have, um, you know, crossed over the Atlantic to the Americas and how they're remade and become, um, become their own thing in every place that they go to. And so, you know, I'm very intrigued with, um, you know, um, uh, the work in Haiti and Vudun and Santeria and Coromble. And then also here in the, you know, in the United States, it's really prevalent. Um, it's prevalent in the food we eat. I just mentioned we had gumbo and it's prevalent in, you know, the way we, uh, do our hair and it's prevalent in, you know, the way we sing and we dance and all of those things. And so I'm just really love how enriched our lives and our culture is because of the African diaspora. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Sure, if we could have the next slide. Yeah. I have a few questions um, and you've already touched on some of the, the questions. Um, you talked about um, beauty ideals and white, um, colonialist ideals of beauty. And my, my first question as an art historian, I'm first of all fascinated with your images and how multivalent they are. They're so seemingly simple, but they point in so many different directions. Um, and I'd love to explore some of those, both the, the inspirations for your work and the relationship to art history. Beauty is always a big topic in art history and the gaze, which you also mentioned is also a huge topic. And my question with these was about beauty and sexuality and eroticism and its relationship to historical imagery, both with the technique of the woodcut, which I've always been fascinated by, the directness of that, which you've spoken of in the past. Um, you've mentioned your inspirations from Elizabeth Catlett, um, the great early 20th century artist and German expressionist. Um, and then it, the art history of these images in relationship to historical images of beauty and you know the mirror image, which can is in part related to your personal experiences, but also art historical precedent. So maybe I'll stop there and let you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it, you know, so much of, you know, our, the, the works of art that we know, you know, historically are by white men and, um, you know, not, there are lots of amazing women uh, making work then as well. Um, but, um, and, and, but they just were not being seen or they were not encouraged. So, um, you know, I think of all of those images of the toilette, right? Where, you know, women are kind of being bathing themselves and whether it's a harem scene or whether it's some odalisque or whether it's, you know, Venus on the half shell or whatnot, we're always kind of being put out there as this sort of, you know, intriguing entity. And so I like sort of mimicking or taking those images and kind of empowering them in terms of, um, you know, in, in this case for um, um, this arcade piece, which was part of a book um, that uh, I collaborated with um, Erica Hunt, a poet named Erica Hunt. And, you know, in this case, she's almost like uh, a Medusa that her gaze, you know, she's looking at you through the mirror and that's why you're not turning the stone. But otherwise, if you're looking at her head on, you'd be in trouble. And so, you know, that these women are kind of like, um, really powerful, maybe even a little dangerous, you know, there's this sort of, uh, um, you know, I kind of still want to play with this idea of, you know, this sort of uh, toying or tantalizing that I think that's what the, um, you know, a lot of the male painters were putting out there, mm -hmm. but, you know, that these are also very dangerous women. And um, so there's this kind of strange sort of space where you're not sure if you're being invited or provoked. Um, and, um, uh, so I'm kind of like playing with, with that space in between there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, again, you know, I think, uh, aside from, you know, having met Elizabeth Catlett when I was um, doing my undergraduate work with Dr. Samela Lewis at Scripps was, um, you know, and then shortly thereafter seeing this really amazing show of, um, German expressionist at, um, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, um, you know, 
those print processes were just really spoke to me. My mother's work was really mostly etching and very refined and very, you needed to have, you know, needed to have the facilities to do that. You needed to have a press and all those things. And I didn't have any of that. And, you know, it was, I had the tools because I had chisels and um, mm. I had a spoon. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> all those prints were made until I got luckily, um, you know, further along enough that I was able to um, to work with professional uh, uh, master printers. And that just really opened the world up for me. But um, Mm -hmm. also made larger editions. And, you know, I guess, you know, what I one thing I didn't mention when we were talking a little bit about sculpture and printmaking was how, you know, the sculpture is very time consuming, especially these life-size figures and they're covered with clad. That's lots of millions of little nails nailed in and all of that. And um, what I loved about printmaking was that it became accessible and, you know, it's great to, you know, be in a collection like Jordan's where, you know, these prints can be sent all over the country and all over the world without a huge amount of expenses for the facilities that, you know, or, you know, we know to install them or to bring them or even for Jordan and ship them. So, um, you know, I just felt, felt printmaking made the work much more accessible. So that was part of the reason mm -hmm. into that. Yeah. Thank you. And just for um, drawing on your mentioned Scripps College, or I think is one of the places where you were doing research in relationship to your practice. And I just mm -hmm. want to ask you as a researcher and um, as for my students who are going to research your work um, for this show, um, how does research play into your practice and how do you combine those the influence about, for example, reading the one on the left here? looks like a historical image, maybe Harlem Renaissance or something, an earlier era of black history. And how does that combine in your work with, with lived experience and, and you know, your experiences that you mentioned growing up with your family and those two aspects? Yeah, I know, I think uh, the works, I think often what I'll do is kind of look at sort of these histories, specifically African-American histories and, um, and kind of try to talk about the present through those histories. I think one is that, you know, we're still experiencing a lot of the same inequities we were in the Harlem Renaissance and even prior to that, um, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, Jim Crow and, you know, whatever else we're experiencing here and now. Um, and so I think that, that working with historical ideas and images and stories have really helped me talk about the present in a way that, um, isn't not isn't then going to be kind of s stuck in that one thing that we can kind of talk about these human experiences and how they span you know centuries sometimes and how often very little has changed. Um, but you know, I really love researching in that. I think it takes you places um, that you wouldn't normally go. You know, I think going back again to Scripps, so that was a really strong sort of, you know, classical education. You know, we studied the Renaissance and we studied Greek and Roman mythologies and all of that. And I love kind of finding parallels between kind of, you know, Greek and Roman mythology and, um, you know, African Yoruba, fun sort of mythologies and then kind of seeing how it still exists and how we live our lives and those stories that we have here and now in contemporary times. And so I love kind of layering or lapping of those things. And, you know, sometimes just a little bit of research will take me someplace that I didn't really expect to go to. So I find that's really, mm -hmm. um, and it helps me get outside of my own head, which is sometimes can be a scary place. So. Well, I think it's what gives us some so many multivalent resonances. Like when you spoke in another context about Sweeping Beauty, uh, which is a print we saw last year at the Mead Museum um, here in Amherst. Wow. It's a full scale print. It's this amazing combination of references to to folk tales and legends, and also the history of women's labor, black women's labor, um, in in the Americas, and um, and images of beauty, and kind of turning everything on its head, which is you know it has these multivalent references. You mentioned that it's almost as if she's preserved in the glass box, like Snow White, I guess, but it's also like a grave scene. Um, the one on the left, the cat's cradle image, is very visceral. Is that red thread becomes all kinds of, you know, it could be read all kinds of ways in terms of the body. And I'm curious about that one, which is a much smaller image um, in terms of its resonances with sexuality, women's labor, and also folk tales and legends and, you know, Cat's Cradle being a children's game, but here it seems to be more kind of sinister. 
Yeah, um, well, that and, you know, you think of um, in terms of weaving and Rapunzel and all these other sort of stories of, you know, women being kind of bound by these kind of tedious labors and, and sort of um, things like that. But, you know, I don't think any, I don't I think it's really, I this piece kind of, um, I don't want to say it's my joke, but, you know, I don't think people really realize where this thread is coming until they really look closely at the piece. Like, yeah, it's just like, yeah, I'm like, what? And so, you know, I think, you know, it's really, to me, it was really kind of talking about that transition from an adolescent female becoming into womanhood and how there's that time where you, you know, you're 12 or you're 13 and you're still a child and you start menstruating and all of a sudden you're supposed to kind of address this larger world. And in many parts of the world, you know, once you start, you know, um, your menses, you're like an adult and you're being put into these really, I think, um, you know, horrific situations. Um, um, you know, where you're expected to behave and, and take on, you know, these really heavy issues of womanhood, womanhood. And so, you know, I think, you know, she's kind of like there and she's kind of, you know, playing with this blood that she doesn't really know what it is. And it's just really kind of talking about that sort of gray area between being a child and a woman sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but then it has this light cat's cradle sort of title. So it's kind yeah. of even the title plays with that a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's really fantastic. And this indigo blue is so striking in your palette that you that comes back again and again. And you have images that return again and again. I just want to end with these two, which are the severed head once again. It reminded me of so many things. You mentioned Roman sculpture. They remind me of Brancusi and modern art and also images of violence against the black male body, right? So the one on the left as a kind of John the Baptist Salome image on a play offered to, you know, what's happened here. It's a story of violence, which has so many resonances today. Um, and the one on the right is both, um, you know, it could be an image of violence, but also power figures. Also the genus in the Roman myth again. So I'm just fascinated by these, again, multivalent images. Um, and here you're kind of, I just wonder if you have a comment on your representation of the black male body as an, as an image of both power and violence um, in these works. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I would say, unfortunately, a lot of the, you know, black male imagery, I think, you know, from, you know, let's say the, throughout the eighties and the nineties, so much, and, and to now, <laughs> So much of what the media was kind of expressing, you know, you know, what we were seeing at the black male body was um, was basically just these horrific acts that were being uh, done, whether it was by the police department or whether it was done by, you know, racist, you know, dragging people from the backs of their trucks. And, um, you know, it's just so many horror stories and, you know, starting with Emmett Till. Right. And. Um, you know, in terms of the media and, and putting that out there. And so I think, you know, a lot of the male figures are sometimes just really sort of visceral sort of responses to those um, horrific acts that are happening. Um, and, you know, John the Baptist kind of falls in, into that category, you know, I'm playing off of, you know, this sort of biblical story of, you know, this kind of wanton woman, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, but, um, but in the in in the long run, it was John the Baptist's head that was on the platter, sort of thing. And then, um, you know, uh, the Janus piece. I was really interested in trying to remember what was going on in the world then. I think some sort of warfare thing going on. And so, you know, for that, I was really interested in you know Janus as being sort of you know the the gates that open for war for peace. And these sort of two faces of those two times. And so, um, you know, one is this sort of placid and also playing off of the traditional Janus masks um, in African art form and how, you know, they'd be this mask with two sides and two faces. And um, and so I was kind of intrigued with kind of creating this, you know, it's, it started out as a sculpture. So one head is kind of this placid, peaceful head and the other head like you said, as an inkis, he had all these nails kind of hammered into it and it was kind of mm -hmm. that anguish. And so that's really where that piece came from, was looking at sort of, I wish I could remember what. Well, maybe the Iraq war, it was when we, uh, 2003, we bombed Iraq, right? Yeah. So we had, right, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna open up at this point for audience questions. Fantastic.
Um, Amanda, are you? Yes. Water? Yes. Hello, everybody. And, um, thank you, Karen, Juana, and oh, for that great conversation. Um, and I think it's a, a really beautiful entry into the work. Um, and as mentioned, I'm really excited for mm -hmm. the UMass community to come and see the work um, in person and then also to for others to explore it online. Um, we have been receiving lots of questions during um, during this event, and I just want to remind guests that you can ask a question um, directly from YouTube, or there's a link um, in the email you received to a form where you can submit questions, and I'll be checking all of those um, as the night goes on. Um, I want to begin with um, a beautiful question from Deborah. Um, she, she asks, or she states, um, that in the book, My Grandmother's Hands um, by Rezima Menekin, the author tells a story about his grandmother's hands, how they were thick skinned and stubby due to picking cotton as a girl. He uses this story as an entryway to describe how trauma lives in the body. You seem to use materials in much the same way from cotton sacking to old tin ceiling tiles, materials that are imbued with history. Please say more about your evocative use of materials that resonate with meaning even before you transform them. <laughs> How that transformation affects not only the material and the thing made, but the maker. Um, yeah, I think it started out with, you know, coming, um, you know, right after I got out of grad school, I moved to New York. And as soon as I moved to New York, I had a residency or I was had a job. And then later the residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And, um, you know, I was really intrigued with this, you know, rich, rich history of Harlem, um, some of which connected with my family in a rather distant sort of way. And, um, but I felt as a 27 year old, it was really hard for me to talk about that because I hadn't really experienced it. I was just like fresh on the ground in Harlem. And so what I did was I started cleaning materials off of the streets. And so that ceiling tin that, you know, you see in all of the work, in fact, um, looking at the John the Baptist, we had inked up a plate of ceiling tin and made a print off of that, a uh, plate off of that. Um, you know, I loved it because, you know, it was basically in all of these, um, you know, buildings that were built, you know, turn of the century, some of them, and they had witnessed all these things that had gone out. And, you know, in the 80s, people were pulling stuff out and they were redoing everything. And so I had all this really, you know, it was, it was imbued with stuff. And so it really felt to me that this was going to help me take that story into the here and now and really talk about things with an understanding that maybe I didn't personally have. So that I really kind of re rely on the materials to bring um, their experience to it. And then with the printmaking, um, for example, the um, um, cotton eater one has, um, is, is on a old, old trigger sack that had been made into a quilt, like the lining of a quilt and um, had been used so many times that um, it became almost like a thin veil. And I love that, you know, people had sex on it, people died on it, people had babies, you know, that this, piece of fabric had experienced all those things. And to really kind of talk about that these are lives that are lived, these are, you know, this is a, a real place in time and those materials help me bring it to that place, so. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the next few questions are more about your process. Um, Lydia asks, how do you locate imagery that is best to express these deep, complicated and complex emotions? How do you find a single image that can express so much? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the image is kind of just, it's, you know, I don't know if it's so much finding, you know, again, a lot of times the materials were really dictate, you know, what's to come of that. And I think, you know, a lot of it comes from collecting stuff. Um, you know, I'll have, I still have like boxes and boxes of scissors that I'm not sure what they mean just yet sort of thing. So, you know, sometimes the material is an attraction prior to an understanding. Um, and, you know, a lot of times the images, again, will come out of kind of contemporary current news. And one of the prints that we were looking at, well, two of the prints, one that thick of the prints that were kind of set up were, um, breach and staunch and um, 
Muddy Water, maybe, is that the right name for that middle one? You know, that was really something that was inspired by Katrina that caused me to go back historically and look at the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and how, you know, some 80 years had passed between those two events and nothing had changed in terms of, you know, Black people, uh, people of color, and poor being put into sort of economically um, danger, uh, ecologically dangerous places, and people living in floodplains and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, sometimes those images just come from events. Uh, I try to. I think maybe because the, the prints end up being these very singular, so, solitary images, is because they are from sculptures, and with the sculptures, because they are this, this kind of iconic, sort of singular figures, that that's how they come. Um, that's why they have these very sort of simple, sort of. Um, um, you know, they're not completely involved with what's going on around them sort of thing. Uh, I don't know, does that answer the question, kind of? <laughs> yeah, that's great, that's great. And then I know that um, you have mentioned in the past that you are influenced or inspired by writers such as Nella Larson and Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I heard you speak about um, one of your pieces that was directly kind of in reference to a um, photograph by Roy de Cordova. Um, I'd love to know, and this is for me and a couple of my students that I work with, what writers or artists are influencing you now? Or is there anything you're reading now um, that you're turning to for inspiration for your Oh, gosh. Well, um, of course, um, we began with a quote from Christina Sharp, who I think's work is really amazing in the wake. Um, it's been really wonderful. I've been reading a lot of poetry, and I've been really fortunate that I've been collaborating with a lot of poets. So I've been reading Evie Shockley and Harriet Mullins and uh, Samia Bashir and Camille Dungy, um, Robin Costa Lewis, just um, really focusing on some really powerful African-American poets, Dion Brand. Um, so I think that's been really, where I've been wanting to go. I have a pile of really wonderful books that are more theoretical. And um, I think at the end of the day, I feel really exhausted and I really love to read to be replenished and really filled up as opposed to having to work at understanding something else outside of myself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where my reading has been going now. I've Again, you know, the other pile gets, and they're all like really amazing, wonderful books, but I'm really feeling, I think maybe that's, part of, you know, COVID and being isolated in that I'm really hungry for just, you know, really beautiful works that take me to other places. So that's what I've been looking at for the most part. That's wonderful. And it kind of connects to one of the, um, my students wanted to know how you, um, how you move forward if you feel artistically blocked. Um, and I think maybe that's part of what you referred to, but do you have any other Kind of tips or tricks to um, kind of push you forward in your work. Gosh, you know that, and it's always really hard. You know, I think, um, you know, the last, well, a year ago was when I had a show at um, Freeze LA, and that was like a big push to get those pieces together, and um, some of which are in the exhibit, which has been really great that Jordan was able to include some of those, um, and you know, then. For, it was really difficult for me and I find it still really difficult. Luckily, I've been working with some print studios and trying to get um, some pieces out um, to, because I haven't also haven't been working that much in my studio um, on my own that much. But um, yeah, you know, I think a lot of what pushes me, sadly to say, are deadlines at this point. <laughs> <laughs> like people are like, well, can you do this? And it all sounds like also wonderful. And so that gets me really to kind of like, you know, but I also need some time where I just, I mean, I'm looking out the window now at this really amazing backyard that I have. I'm really blessed to have a really wonderful um, space in the canyon, which is really lush and green at the moment. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's between just kind of sitting back and letting myself go blank. Music has been really inspirational for me and helps me get out of blocks. And you'll notice that, you know, students are walking through the exhibit and I would say probably 50% of the titles come out of music. Um, it's been a real integral part of, you know, my growing up um, and hearing music in the household and having friends that are musicians. Um, and I think, you know, when you're listening to music, 
um, for me, you close your eyes and you listen to music and images come. So I think that's maybe one of the ways that really lets me uh, come up with stuff. <laughs> great, that's great to hear, great answer. Um, I have one question now for Jordan, which um, is more about um, what piece of Alison Sauer's work most inspires you and what, why do you feel, um, how do you feel this, what did you learn from Mira Mira that maybe you um, didn't know about Alison as an artist um, once you put this show together? I think it's probably like saying, which of your children do you like the best? And I guess it depends <laughs> upon the hour of the day, right? Uh, <laughs> So, so often I ask, well, what's your favorite piece? I'll just make up an answer. Um, um, I think what I find so intriguing first is I'm glad you all ask questions about materiality because, you know, the, 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 the handkerchiefs that she did at tandem with those, oh my God, I mean, I mean each thing conveys different kinds of messages due to the, due to the influence or the impact of the, of the materials that she's using. Um, the mirror pieces, uh, I think, as soon as I saw those, I was just in raptured with you know thinking about mirrors thinking about reflecting ourselves others all those themes you can write i mean we could have a year of sociology classes and uh, in at umass amherst just on that just pick a piece um i think the um the pieces uh, where she has the luggage and all those things on top of one's head um just hits you it's you know we read we read so much you see documentaries we human beings, we can empathize, project, sympathize, whatever. Ultimately, until we go through certain experiences, you don't have the full depth of them. But her work, I think, just seduces us, sucks us in to understand uh, the, 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 the travails, the, the, the journey that um, those who came before us, let alone those now, went through. So... Uh, um, um, and that's what I admire about her as an artist is while she's within the same zone of themes, she keeps uh, like a diamond uh, with different, cutting different facets to look at it from different angles, which each one expands mine, I think all of our appreciation, and depth of understanding. You know, also sometimes what I'll say to people when I go to these openings and a lot of people say, yeah, this contemporary art, you know, <laughs> Ugh, why can't they just paint nice, bowls of fruit or nice beach scenes and i'll say look all these artists went to art school they painted painted plenty of bowls and plenty of beach scenes and so forth but i said to be on i said you know we all took art classes we're all artists but to be on the walls of umass amherst two things have to happen both of which she does first you've got to have this passion inside you that's willing to come out and rip your guts out and put them on a wall a sculpture whatever material it is and have it out there for everyone to look at criticize and whatever and second, you got to do it in a different way. And she created her own brand, her own style. Uh, and therefore, that's why I think she's so effective in her messaging, but uh, so brilliant in, 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 in just from an artistic standpoint, what, what she creates. Uh, I mean, I can't get enough of these pieces. Each one I look at them, I say, wow, <laughs> you know, why don't I have that one? And <laughs> I've done a pretty good job getting a lot of them, haven't I? <laughs> no, I love it. And, 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 in, and in terms of, to finish up real quickly, part of the, 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 the joy I get is by being able to amass a lot of work, it's to be able to serve Loretta. And that's how, for me, my whole program is about the art and the audience. Okay, And by being able to get not only the prints of her work, the works on paper and the wood, whatever, but these other sculptures and so forth, it allows everyone that goes and visits that show to enter her world and see it, as I said, just as I experienced with the, each of her different materials, a different facet of similar kinds of themes. So uh, I've loved seeing all the work and I can't wait to get back uh, to UMass Amherst in a month or two and just see how the preparators and how you arranged all the work uh, because it speaks differently to us in different surroundings and different combinations. Right. Thank you. You know, Jordan, we're, we're going to have a class called Collecting 101, and we're going to ask the students to um, purchase a work of Allison's for the collection. And this is really setting a milestone as to how students can choose art. And um, it's all because of the exhibition and because of Allison's work that is missing in our collection. So um, it's another avenue for exploration, uh, how the work will be purchased 
and um, decided upon. It's a, it's a learning experience for the students to understand what what and how you evaluate uh, collections. And we'll maybe bring, bring you back as a speaker, Jordan, to talk about that as well. Yeah. You know, Allison, Allison, I had a question, and boy, I sure loved it, both, both your questions, all the questions you were asking, but I've had my own thoughts about it. But in terms of your use of cotton, which you use a lot, out of the mouths, out of the hair, whatever, <clears throat> tell me about your, why, How are you using that symbolism in terms of your views of it? Yeah, well, you know, I think, you know, cotton is maybe the first that comes to mind of all the five slave crops in the United States that slaves were brought here to basically cultivate. And what was interesting about cotton and rice and indigo is that those were all crops that were, were um, cultivated in Africa. And so, you know, we came here with a certain amount of expertise in how to deal with these materials. But then at the same time, you know, we were being held hostage by them. And, you know, in some ways, you know, I think I'm really intrigued with the way the landscape and has kind of, you know, the sort of dance between, um, you know, slaves being brought to the Americas and the relationship to the landscape and the landscape basically beckoning and drawing them into it, but also how the landscape has served us in terms of escape and survival and how the landscape um, still enriches our lives now. I mean, it's not really often that people really think about, you know, African-American culture and, and nature. And there's actually some, a couple of really great books out now. And that's one that's on my, that I'm reading now is, um, uh, Camille Dungy's collection of poems on nature by African-American writers. And so, you know, cotton to me is really interesting in that it's not indigenous to the Americas and that it has, you know, it's it's a really, you know, it's a really, historically it was a really grueling crop. It was very hard, hard to cultivate and that it basically emaciated the ground that it was planted on, you know, um, we had to cycle those crops because otherwise it would just drink everything out of the soil. So I was real intrigued in that sort of hungry ghost nature of cotton. And, um, but also how, you know, you know, post slavery that there are a lot of black cotton farmers and how that's still a lot of, you know, I mean, I didn't, I have family from Louisiana, but I've never picked cotton, but you know, I know that that's a part of you know a lot of African Americans in Texas and throughout the South. That's part of their experience of growing up and their livelihood, and so it just kind of has this weird, it's this component that kind of traverses all of these, um, you know, parts of our lives, um, both negative and some positive. And so I'm really intrigued with that um, and kind of the power it's held over us in the past. Um, so it's, that's a little rambling uh, talk about how it means many things to me. How's that? <laughs> can, can I ask you another, mm -hmm. another question here? Um, uh, I've often said that I think uh, looking back, if we go forward 20 or 30 years, I think the art historians and all the writers would have looked back at the time from the t 1990s or 20s to 2020 or 30 or 40, mm -hmm. that I think, so, in my opinion right now, the best and brightest work being done is by uh, artists of color and especially the fe the female artists of color. Um, and you look at yourself and Ellen Gallagher and Kara Walker and Lorna Simpson and and uh, and let alone, I mean, the Bank Willis Thomas and the Leonard Drews and, and, and you know, building upon the legacy of others. But I mean, it's a plethora of amazing work. And what I try to say is that, you know, it's decades later than it should have, but artists of color are coming, especially the women, into their own <laughs> and, mm -hmm. reflecting, and reflecting the themes and uh, their legacies and their histories and their perspectives on things. Um, how do you, you're in the middle of, 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 the, the, of the tornado, okay? Uh, how would you describe if someone asked you that question? Okay, why now? Uh, now. And, um, um, well, the question is, why not sooner, is my question. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's been waves. I think there was some interest, you know, along with the feminists 
art movement, um, you know, in the 70s, you know, I think a lot of women of color were coming to, um, were getting shown in museums and galleries, mother included amongst those. Um, and you think of Faith Ringgold, um, you know, and it's, you know, I, actually what I hope happens now is that people take the time to go back and see all of those that have been overlooked historically. I mean, like, I think, and I think I see that happening with the shows with Jack Whitten and Alma Thomas and, you know, um, Howardina Pendel has been a lot of, you know, she's been getting a lot of attention, which is long overdue. And so, and Mildred Howard. So, you know, it's really exciting for me to have all these really young, powerful, female artist uh, of color on the scene. But I think, um, you know, I think it's really wonderful that people are also taking the time to look back and really recognize those that have been overlooked. And, um, and why now? Um, you know, I think these are stories that, you know, have been so long suppressed and I think people really need to hear them. I think people may be hopefully now ready to hear them. So I think that's part of that. <laughs> Thank you for your question though. <laughs> You know, getting on the political side, the Black Lives Matter. What I've said is, you know, we've been working on those themes. I've had, you know, 30, 40 shows of, of artists of color in the last 25 years. I've funded symposiums on black white relationships in Boise and Laramie, Wyoming, and I mean, all the places and so forth. Um, has that movement um, affected your art? I mean, the, the, the themes are themes that you've live with and whatever, but I'm saying in terms of that Black Lives Matter, the protests uh, in our cities across the country and all that's gone on, has that uh, affected you personally and affected your art in some way that would be interesting for you to tell us about? Mm. You know, like you said, it's something that's always been part of what I've been addressing and I think um, you know, ever since the civil rights movement, I think it was young, you know, during the early parts of the civil rights movement and how those same energies were, you know, going around then. I think now it's kind of crossed the color line a little bit. And I think you've got more people kind of brought into the fold, which is great and which is encouraging. But that's not to say that, you know, I guess I'm also very skeptic because I've seen this wave crest before. <laughs> and, um, I just think, you know, I'm, I'm feeling that every time we get a little bit farther, you know, I think of, you know, um, uh, Bill Robinson's routine with Shirley Temple going up three stairs and then back down two. It's like, okay, well, eventually we're going to get to the top of the staircase, but it's going to take a lot of these, um, you know, movements and they're going to go in waves because every, I mean, we're experiencing it now, sort of this really, really terrifying, frightening, racist backlash that we're getting. Um, and not to say that that hasn't always been there, but because mm. social media has made it much more vocal and, you know, we're experiencing it up front and in our faces a lot more than we had been um, on a consistent level, I think, as of late. Um, but I think it's inspiring because you're seeing so many people being very passionate about it and that I feel, you know, again, we're not going to, you know, that we keep moving forward, even if it's in incremental movements. So. Um, Anyway. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, thank you. I couldn't agree more. And I'm so excited to share your work with the students because I think, um, and, our, and our community, because that's where that movement's going to continue, um, being inspired by what you've shown us and what you teach us with your work. So thank you. you, know, you know, let, let, me, let me ask you another really loaded question. <laughs> and that is this movement. It started with, it started with the, the Confederate statues and things that were brought down and so forth. And now we're seeing a wave of, uh, in San Francisco, you saw they took the names of like 30, 40 uh, names off uh, Wilson High School link. I mean, um, as in my words, a chronicler of our time, okay, and a leading voice of these issues of white supremacy and racism and gender and inequality and all these things if you were making decisions about taking names, statutes down, names off buildings and so forth, how would you decide that? Uh, well, you know, I think, you know, that there are people up there that are being put on the plinths and pedestals that have, you know, um, 
And it's it's really, you know, as a person working in public art, it's it's complicated because I know that, um, you know, I've been asked to do pieces for institutions that have very dark, dark histories and who, you know, you know, they, you know, they've, you know, to kind of do sort of counter pieces to pieces that exist and whether that, you know, whether that's going to solve the problem or not. But, the you know, it's problematic to have these, you know, racist, you know, murders on pedestals. <laughs> and so, you know, I think, and especially in light of, you know, people claim, well, this is our history and in, in light of how so many of them were, you know, were not, aren't even in Confederate States, let alone, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just so transparent in terms of why these sculptures are there. The sculptures are there basically, you know, to intimidate um, African-Americans, Native Americans, and other people of color that have been, you know, oppressed by these parties. And so I feel they definitely need to rethink, you know, who is being honored and who is being put up on a pedestal and why. And I think, um, you know, I support that. And then, the, but then there's the question of who replaces those spaces. Um, so I think there's a lot of reckoning yet to be done. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're just a little bit after the 6 p.m. mark now. Um, I mean, this virtual event sets a precedent for us. This was just everything we had all hoped for. I'm getting text messages from people saying, do it from here on. I mean, even when we open to the public, we're going to have virtual openings like this. Really, I'm I'm just elated by this conversation on the highest level. Thank you all. Um, just two closing remarks I want to make. There is this brochure. We You can download the, short, the Jordan Sister Foundation produced this brochure to the exhibition. Uh, we have it as a PDF. You can download it. And those who come to the museum, our academic community can pick them up free of charge. It's a 14-page beautiful brochure. Um, so please, uh, it's available and um, we'll make it available even after the exhibition closes because we'll have it on hand. And um, on another note, because some of so many of us are home cooking as therapy, Allison has produced a cookbook. <laughs> it's available on her gallery website, Recipes for Trouble, ten dollars. <laughs> I've got my copy, and it's a it's a you know it's a soothing, uh, beautifully designed cookbook. So um, it's for you all to have if you go to her wonderful gallery's website, lalouver.com. Um, thank you all, really, um, and thank you to our audience. Um, please stay tuned as we continue our live chats and other openings. Um, and this event is recorded, so so much uh, food for thought food for thought that was um, <laughs> offered to us this evening. Thank you all, truly um, a great pleasure to see you all virtually. And maybe we'll have a celebration to bring you all back. Great, thanks so, so much, much. appreciate it. Thank, 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 thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you all. Oh,